Councilwoman Barrett. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just reporting out that this morning the board hosted our general advisory committee meeting from 10 to 12 in this room. I really felt like it was a really productive meeting. We're, we're actually looking at reimagining the general advisory uh, group, and we received really helpful and meaningful feedback from the members who attended today. So I just wanted to report that out to the public. You all board were there, so you knew what happened. That's all I have to report. Thanks. Okay, great. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, September 26th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, September 26th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So let the record show it was a 4-0-1 vote with Maureen abstaining uh, because she was away. So with that, we're going to um, move on to um, what I found to be a truly fascinating presentation that um, Tom and I were able to um, see at the Workforce Summit at Castleton. And um, just to reiterate a few points, um, that I tried to make down there. If you take a look at Vermont demographics, it's it's not a great um, story to tell. When we had uh, twice as many people in the state that were under 18 as over 65 just a couple of decades ago, we're now at the point where we have equal numbers. And we were also at the point where we've lost 20,000 of the working age Vermonters. So. Um, we are a very old state in an old country in a young world, and workforce issues um, are hitting all areas of Vermont's um, structure, whether you're in the construction business or you're running a hospital. And the point that I would like to make is that in healthcare, we hear repeatedly from Jeff's members how many travelers are employed at different hospitals, whether they be doing nursing or, or um, medical work or tech, or even as a tech, in that each time when we ask how much they cost, they cost twice as much as what it would cost to employ in a, a Vermonter. And it just seems like uh, we've got two stories going forward. And the one story is that people have to leave Vermont in order to be successful in a career. And the reality is, is they don't have to leave Vermont, that there are very good rewarding jobs that are left open in Vermont that have good benefits, um, good pay, and you can retire with dignity. And so that summit was the start of reaching out to our partners in higher ed and elsewhere to see what could be done. And um, some of the interesting takeaways before I turn it over to Mary Ann, um, that we heard um, at that summit is it's four different institutions of higher education in the nursing field were represented at the summit. And I'm pretty sure that at least three of the four said that they could have additional capacity in their programs if they had the clinical placements for the students. So this is something that um, we all have to work together on solving. And Deb just walked in, and Deb, I'm, t I'm giving a quick recap of the summit. And um, what I was talking about is the fact that um, if we all want to solve this, then everybody has to be working together, whether it's higher education, um, providers themselves. Um, if you take a look at what happened with the College of St. Joseph, um, it wasn't just money that stopped them from getting the PA program through, it was also problems trying to find the placements for their students in the clinical settings. And the good news is from people that were at the summit, like Jill Olson from the VNAs, even though they don't have money to invest in things, they are willing to step forward and provide the opportunities for students. And I know talking to a few um, heads of um, our community action programs and also our mental health programs, that they're also willing to 
step up and provide those settings. So, <coughs> that candy I had at the uh, full capital just kicked in. <laughs> I'm not sure what was in it, but. <laughs> Anyways, um, long story short, there's more that all of us can do to try to uh, solve this problem. And um, my favorite quote whenever I talk about workforce issues comes from the head of the, the visiting nurses and hospice for the Southwest region. And he would always tell those of us in the legislature that sooner or later, he was gonna to have to take care of our sorry old butts in that we better take care of them. So um, <laughs> one of the things that happened at the uh, summit was a fascinating presentation with a lot of new um, data that we hadn't seen before. And I know that when Tom and I walked out of the summit, we, we talked about how we almost uh, had hoped that Marianne had been the first person presenting at the summit because it was all new information to us. And we started wondering, well, if it's new information to us, have others heard the presentation? And that's why we reached out and we're very, very fortunate that Marianne had a change in her schedule that is allowing this to occur. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you and, and uh, I hope that the audience uh, finds it as fascinating as what Tom and I found it uh, at the summit. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, as, as Kevin said, um, my name is Mary Ann Sheehan and I work for the Vermont Business Roundtable. Um, the Vermont Business Roundtable, uh, um, first I'm going to just mention three people in this room have already heard this presentation. So um, I typically like to make it interactive, but I understand that we have a, um, a moment at the end, that, like, well, or 15 minutes or so, that we can actually have an open dialogue about it. Um, the Vermont Business Roundtable has been around for over 30 years. It's an organization that's made up of a membership. And to be a member of it, you have to be either a CEO or a president, which sounds very exclusive. But the Vermont Talent Pipeline is, a, um, we're, we're part of the Vermont Business Roundtable Research and Education Foundation, and we um, are inclusive of every, every organization that's out there. So when we do our work, we work in a sector strategy with a, a particular industry. And the industries that we've been in so far are construction, healthcare, and manufacturing. But we, we invite every um, member of the business community to participate. Um, it's an employer-led um, strategy, meaning we work with employers to identify their most critical jobs and what the requirements of those jobs are, and also to forecast the number of them so that we can translate that information and give it to the education community. Um, we didn't develop this uh, program by ourselves. It's going through the United States in a national rollout, and it was uh, it's basically a set of strategies and some tools that um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation developed. So uh, the folks in our state who have been through the training for it are in different parts of the state. Um, some regional partners, we have somebody in Brattleboro, somebody in uh, St. Albans, and then um, some statewide partners. And I consider myself a statewide uh, neutral convener of uh, employers. So um, that's just sort of the framework that we work within. So um, the model that we use is called collective impact. So I'm not sure how many folks are familiar with collective impact, but the idea behind it is that you, um, you get people together who have an interest in the same subject. In this case, it's in talent. So when you think about healthcare and talent, we have a number of people who um, are uh, organizations out there who are looking for talent in order to be um, be able to do their job or to grow in the industry. So um, I'm just going to point out that the employer is the center of this. I have to stand. I'm not used to saying. <laughs> the employer is the center of this world. So um, in this case, we've invited all of the hospitals and a number of visiting nurses and home health agencies and um, also uh, rehab centers and some um, retirement communities 
to participate in this. Um, I'm not saying that we were successful at getting everyone, because we weren't. We got 34 um, employers who were interested in participating. Um, but the employer is the center of our world here. So this is just one perspective that exists, and it happens to be the employer perspective. So the idea behind this is we are Vermont Tile Pipeline Management. That's what that little logo up in the right um, represents. And these are the folks who are involved in um, the work that goes on in terms of developing talent. So we have regional workforce partners in every part of the state. I mentioned that we have somebody who went through the training from Broward, another person from St. Albans. We've actually done in-house training in the state of Vermont for all the regions, including Rutland, Middlebury, um, St. Johnsbury, Chittenden County, Bennington, Central Vermont. So we try to cover um, most of the state with uh, with um, regional regional partners who are neutral convening partners. Now that means that they're not an employer and they're not an educator. They're people who have relationships with businesses throughout the state. The whole idea behind this is we're engaging businesses in the conversation and the dialogue. Um, so industry associations were invited to the table. Um, policy makers, educators, government agencies, we couldn't do any of this work without partners. I'm also going to mention um, myself, I, my background is I'm a project management professional. So I am not an industry expert and I am not an educator. Um, my, my job here is to facilitate consensus among a number of diverse employers. So that's the work that we're doing. So um, when we say what is Vermont Talent Pipeline, um, talent pipeline management is actually the generic term used across the United States. And um, Vermont actually has a statewide rollout. We're the first state to actually implement it in a state model. We have other states who, have, who are starting to do this as well. I went to Michigan to help them roll it out um, in August. We have Kentucky who's going through it right now, and Tennessee is going to follow after them. So, um, it's a set of strategies and also a set of web tools which allow us to do some survey design based on employer input. So this, these are the strategies, there's six of them. I'm just going to point out that these three here on the left side are all employer only. So we don't engage any um, additional folks that you just saw in the collective impact thing. Um, anywhere in this part. We do a full um, facilitation of what are the most critical jobs, what's the demand for those jobs, what are the skill requirements for it, before we share anything. Here, this is where we are in um, uh, advanced manufacturing right now. This is where we are in construction. This is where we are in healthcare. So we're in different stages of all these different pieces at any given time. Um, we couldn't do this work, again, without our partners. So it would mean nothing if we didn't share it. Collective impact is inc incredibly inclusive, and there's no point in doing the work unless we're sharing the data with, it, with the community. So I'm just going to point out, we have a website, and all of our reports are available here. Um, try to make them uh, interesting to read. They're not just data. <laughs> so um, if you wanted to read uh, about healthcare, you could. So um, we have these six strategies. Three of them are employer only. And then this side is where the um, education and training community comes in. Uh, one of the most obvious questions here is um, we have supply and demand model. Okay. So this side is really, here's the demand that we have. And over here, we have, here's the supply of education and training. It's a little bit different than what we've seen in the past. So in the past, we used to take people who were coming out of programs and try to plug them into jobs. Now what we're doing is we're saying, here's the jobs we have. Can you create a training program that will work for us? So sometimes, and we know that the state of Vermont has a, has a changing demographic, we're talking about youth. You know, and we're talking about how do we engage youth. But in the case of Vermont, our biggest opportunity is in the adult population, people who have actually graduated from high school and did not get any 
post-secondary degree or credential. So those are people who are now more interested in looking for careers, and um, this becomes much more applicable to that group of folks. Um, I don't know how many people in here have ever heard of WIOA funding. Um, WIOA funding is federal funding that's available. Um, and typically what they're looking for in order to fund um, programs from, from the federal government is um, a sector strategy that's data driven that uses employers as its base. So I, this is just my guess. I'm, I'm thinking that the US Chamber of Commerce Foundation took the WIOA funding model and said, let's build a program that actually works this way. And so that's what we're coming up with. We're, at, we're actually, at this point, building the pipeline with educators. Um, that, that can take a serious amount of time, depending on what level of training we're talking about. So, um, and continuously improving is just getting better and better, making the, making the capacity broader, the time to completion shorter, or the quality better. So those are the things that we're looking at doing. Okay, so our first, um, First step is we invite employers to come together, and we do this by inviting the CEOs and the presidents of these organizations. We typically ask an industry champion to do this for us. In the case of healthcare, we ask John Brumstead, and he is our industry champion. So he invited all the hospitals and um, home health and you know visiting nurses and um, rehab centers and folks to come together in a dialogue and decide whether or not they wanted to be part of this group. Um, we actually had 34 employers who came to the table, including all 15 hospitals in the state. We didn't get um, Dartmouth Hitchcock to come to our first um, discussion because we didn't think outside the box there. We were thinking that that was not a Vermont organization. We did end up including them in our work. So I just wanted to put that in perspective. But the reason that they came together was basically to forecast um, new and replacement hires for the most critical jobs and define the competency and credential requirements. The value to them is that they're able now to provide clear hiring signals on what they're looking for in a way that's really collective. So for instance, if you were to say, um, we want to hire a healthcare assistant, what does that mean? It might mean different, pe different things to different people. It might be uh, you know, uh, a personal care aid. It might be an LNA. Um, so we work on coming together in um, a model where we all are speaking the same language. And that's part of the work that we're doing here. OK, let's see. OK, so when we develop a survey, we ask them, um, to identify what their most valued employee, the characteristics of their most valuable employee. And um, hospitals, we do paired interviews. So we're using something called appreciative inquiry in this case, where we're appreciating the people who are really good, who work for us. And they talk about why, the qualities of those people. Um, you know, they have excellent employability skills, they really know how to work with people, they um, have all their licensing requirements. They know how to communicate up and downward. You know, they, they might give um, information like that. And then what we ask them, each um, member who's there, each employer, what are the top five jobs that you're looking to hire for? So what comes out of that is a, a list. And you might get, you know, we, have, we need physicians. We need physical therapists, we need occupational therapists, we need registered nurses, we need LPNs, LNAs. Um, it, we heard everything, okay? But everyone could say, here's my top five. They put it on a note card and then they sort it. So remember, I am not an industry expert, I'm facilitating a discussion here. They come to consensus on what the top, typically we say five roles are. Um, in this case, what rises to the top? All of the jobs in the nursing career, by the way. Those are the most critical jobs in healthcare right now. So now we've identified this, we need to place value on it, okay? So I'm just gonna say, this is what the survey looks like. 
We ask them what are the most critical jobs and they tell us. And these are, this is the list. Personal care aide, licensed nurse assistant, licensed practical nurse, registered nurse, nurse educator, clinical nurse manager, advanced practice mental health nurse. This is, I call that a red herring. I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. And nurse practitioner. So typically, advanced practice mental health nurse is uh, a primary care role. Um, this was identified several times, but it also fell into the category of registered nurse because a lot of places said they wanted a mental health nurse who was a registered nurse. It didn't have to be an advanced practice level nurse. So that was something that we learned more about when we asked questions. So we asked how many new and how many replacement positions. And if you can see this far, I'm just going to say, if it doesn't apply to your organization, you just check that box. This is what our survey is. They tell us what they need, and we ask them how many they need. The, there are follow-on pages that say, what are the competencies? What are the credential requirements? What is the education level that you're looking for? And they can evaluate what's important to them. So, but this is really the, the meat of it is right here. So um, I'll just say this is, this is tricky for you guys to read, but I'm, I'm going to point out um, this is what our forecast looks like for nursing. So we ask them what period of time they want to um, they look at. We said, we did this survey in April, so we said we're going to look at a two-year forecast. How are we going to do that? We're going to look over the last two years, and we're going to um, get a number that we feel, you know, we've hired for each of these positions. We're going to consider how many retirements we think we're going to have. We're going to talk about our attrition rate, and then we're going to also talk about growth. So I'll just say blue means new positions, and orange means replacement positions. If you look at this graph, what you see the most of is registered nurse and LNA, right? Uh, I'll, I'll just say a, a few things just from my general observations here. Look how much orange we have there. That means that if you, if you really are looking at data, this graph is really basically tells you everything you need to know. Um, we have a 75% turnover rate in nursing careers in two years' time. That's, that's big. Why do we have that? Um, so I'll say for licensed nurse assistant, I think our number is actually artificially low because we really only had about seven um, nursing homes who were involved in this. So we suspect that number is much, much higher knowing that we have over 100 nursing homes in our state. Um, personal care aid, I don't have much to add on that one. Um, the licensed practical nurse seems to be a role that also is in nursing homes. That's where, uh, like, we use AHEC um, data on where these jobs are. Uh, every time someone um, gets relicensed in nursing, they actually capture some data through AHEC, and they are able to show our supply of nurses is um, mostly in what, what career fields. LNAs are typically, um, sorry, um, LNAs and licensed practical nurse, the majority of those jobs tend to be in nursing home environments. So um, that's, that's the interesting points here. Um, so, just as a, at a glance, 74% of the jobs in nursing are replacement jobs due to attrition and retirements. They're expecting that perhaps 30%, so a, a national average for retirements is about 7% with baby boomers right now. Um, so they think that they have, in the nursing career field, uh, potentially 30% retirements. When we asked why, they said, well, there's a number of reasons why, but we have an aging workforce. We also have some challenges, workforce challenges, which have to do with the lack of workforce in every career, and the nurse being the front line. So 
there's much, much deeper explanations for this if you were to read you know, the summary, but I'll just say um, there's a lot of reasons why there's turnover in this, and I think we can make a dent in that. Um, so what, what big questions that came out of this, how can nurse education partners increase, increase capacity or decrease time to completion? So when we share this information out with the education community, the um, folks who are in education looked at this and said, well, they're not complaining about our quality. The quality, they, their nurses are typically licensed. So 53% um, of the jobs that we're referring to are RNs. Um, so how can we increase capacity for this? We identify what some of the bottlenecks are. We talked about um, legislation and um, regulation amendments. There's a whole bunch of things that can be done, but we need to have collective impact to do it. Educators together can come up with some of these ideas, and they have. So um, then we, another question that we have is how can employers increase retention? We haven't brought that to them yet, but that is a big question. And then how can we eliminate the bottleneck of clinical educators, clinical placements, and clinical managers. So I'm gonna just go back one slide here. If you look here, clinical nurse managers and clinical nurse educators are really small numbers. That's the forecast, right? Um, they also happen to be the bottleneck to all of these other jobs. So if we don't have them, we don't have these other jobs. So those are, really, really important pieces. One of the things that really jumped out at me too at the summit, uh, Marianne, was the conversation over how little the people that are actually teaching our new nurses are making mm -hmm. comparison to what their students make when they actually enter the field. Exactly. And uh, it's kind of alarming. Well, so what we heard from the educators was um, nurse educators are uh, technically trained and they're also, they also have to have the addition of educational training. They have these two incredible qualities, yet they're paid lower than some educators and not at the level of a nurse. So there's a disconnect there. That's you know, one of our first uh, items that we identified. So this here is a list of um, recommendations that the educators came up with. And um, we, we organize in these work groups to say, okay, we have a list of recommendations that we've come up with. We've prioritized them into these groups, and if we work on them together, I think we can move this. Um, now, I'm just going to point out, when we started with this discussion, we were talking educator to educator, but there's a certain level where, as you, as you get deeper in this, you realize that we can't do this without the employer. So educators can only do so much without the help of employers. But some of the things that they want to do are increase awareness and preparation for nursing careers. So some of this will start in um, middle school. Other parts will happen at the secondary level in general education in high school or in tech centers in high school. And then it, once they're um, able to learn about those careers, how do they get in? Now, a lot of people think, okay, if you've missed the boat at UVM, let's just use that as our, um, our Vermont model for nursing. Um, if you miss the boat at UVM, you can't transfer in. There's no transfers there. They don't have capacity to take extra people. If you, um, there are programs in our state though that offer um, preparation I'll just say CCB has a number of preparation courses that allow people to enter at a second um, second year student, say at Norwich or at Castleton. So there are ways to get into it that um, don't appear obvious to people who are just starting out in school. So one of the biggies is we need to develop and improve nurse educator training because what we what we've been seeing is. One day you're a nurse, and the next day you're a nurse educator. So, you know, it, not all nurse educators are created equally. They, um, 
they need some uh, better understanding for what the education <coughs> process is, how to assess people, and how to um, motivate them to stay in their field. So um, there are a whole bunch of regulation barriers that we talked about that we know about that we can probably affect if we work together on them. So I'll just mention a couple of them. One is that um, all of our neighboring states, Massachusetts, New York, and New Hampshire, have a regulation that says, you can't come here to do a clinical placement unless you pay us. You have to register um, with us, and, that, and that's like a five-year registration cost, about $18,000. And then each placement is going to cost you about $4,000 a year. So that makes it really hard for us to send people to our neighboring states. Vermont doesn't have any of those regulations. So if you want to come to do a clinical placement in Vermont, call the hospital. You might get one. Yeah, I, you know, if you're from some other state, we don't have those same problems, you know, of it's, it's easy access. And I'm not saying that this is the right thing, but should we put some guidelines around that? Somebody who's smarter than me would have to answer that question. I'll just say it's something that needs to be investigated. How can we be part of this um, system this, that's going on in other states and still have placements for our own students? Um, so we still need to improve our clinical placement strategies. And we heard from a great model that VTC has where they said um, they had a relationship with North Country Hospital where VTC actually had a person who was um, paid for by the hospital who, who worked for VTC and did clinical placements at North Country Hospital. So they, they actually named it after the woman who uh, came up with the idea. And I'm going to not try to remember her name. <laughs> but um, they, uh, they actually have a really good strategy for how to, how to make clinical placements work for them. And it's a relationship that exists between educators and employers working together. So that's a model I think we can replicate in other places. And then the last one is um, employer-sponsored hiring solutions. So we need employers to get more actively engaged in um, the development of these students all along the way. For instance, I'll just say we, we have a number of um, ways that uh, students are able to have clinical experiences. Um, they don't all have to have clinical experiences in acute care settings. They could potentially have clinical experiences in settings that are, um, say, non-acute. I mean, like nursing home experiences that give them a more well-rounded uh, training and, you know, um, more hours and more uh, ability to develop into a, a decent employee for an employer. And the employers can have more uh, input into that, and, uh, developing internships and uh, work-based learning opportunities. So that's where we see it going. So these are the ideas of the education community. Um, what, we, what we plan to do is bring it back to the, edu to the employers and then um, <coughs> say, here's what we need from you. And this is like the next step in our dialogue. Nursing is it's an industry that's uh, it's well regulated. It's licensed. It's, you know, the folks in it have really great skills. But how do we get more of them? That's our question. So that's where we're going with this work. I'd like to open this up to your comments and questions because I'm only giving you one perspective, which is really the employer perspective. Um, I touched a little bit on the education community. We haven't talked at all about labor market. Where is the labor market? The three-dimensional model. So that's where we need more partners. Let's hear from you guys. What do you, what do you, what do you think about this? OK, board members. Well, one of the things that fascinated me just sitting in at my little round table at Castleton was the um, the insight that you had about which schools offer employers opportunity. Um, and there was a discussion, as you recall, about 
UVM being a, a great school, but they also have a lot of out-of-state students there that tend to come, get trained, and leave, uh, as opposed to, I think it was Vermont Technical College, for certain of those uh, nursing careers, and Norwich uh, for other other of those careers. So maybe if you could talk a little bit about that, that yeah. um, you know there are pathways out there that uh, uh, you know that this system, your approach revealed, yeah. but to the person seeking that pathway, it might not be readily uh, clear to them that, that that's the way to go. Yeah. So. Um, what Tom's referring to is the talent flow analysis. So um, I, I didn't really talk about that, but that's what we just completed in the healthcare world. So we asked people to look back over um, their quality employers, uh, so, sorry, sorry, quality employees in each of the categories of nursing. We said, go back and find all of the people who are still working for you who have worked for you for at least two years, meaning, they are in the 25% category. You're, um, these are people who have been with you more than two years. And um, what we want to hear is, where did they come from? What did, where did they get their education? Who was their previous employer? And what was the recruiting source? So we asked every one of the employers to um, upload their data on those specific people knowing that this is only one quality indicator, okay? So retention is just one of many quality indicators. You could have, um, you know, any kind of a, a organizational uh, performance reviews, things like that. But this is one that's standard across all of the industry, um, retention. So what we found was that um, Vermont Tech had more people than uh, say UVM, Castleton, or Norwich, who were retained in Vermont hospitals and healthcare environments. So, if you ask me to um, describe why, I would just say there's probably a lot of reasons why. But some of them might be who goes to Vermont Tech? Vermonters. Who goes to UVM? Yeah, it's 80% like out of state. Nursing happens to be the hardest program to get into at UVM. So I'll just say um, they have limited capacity there, so they're able to take the cream of the crop. Many of those are out-of-state students. We, we do have a fair number, and I don't know the actual number for the College of Nursing. I'll just say, in general, UVM has 80% out-of-state students and 20% in-state. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to add to that, too. Part of it was DTC right now is the only school in the state that had, still offers an associate degree in nursing for a two year exactly. degree. And they also get a lot of non traditional students, people going back to school. Yep. That maybe can't think about going back to school for four years if they have a family. But two years is doable. And these are people that are already living here, investing here, and staying here. Right, and great description. I mean, there, you guys could probably come up with many more ideas like that, but that's a, a great one. Yeah. Um, I actually think that the way VTC has their program structured, it's a one plus one plus two, meaning stackable credentials. Their first year, you get the LPN, LPN, um, and an LPN is not always a college program, but VTC has um, given credit to that program if you were to continue at VTC. Um, for a second year to get your associate's degree. Now, an associate's degree will still get you an RN, just like a bachelor's degree, but now hospitals are looking for folks with bachelor's degree to improve um, the quality of their nursing. So I'm just gonna say um, quality is measured in a variety of different ways. If retention is one of them, Having a bachelor's degree may or may not be the quality indicator that they need. Um, one of the reasons that employers are saying this is because uh, there's some, and Deb, I'm going to look to you for help on this, um, is because there's some pressure associated with um, being a quality hospital that says your nurses should be bachelor's degree um, credentialed. So if you get a job as a registered nurse, um, 
If you get a job as a registered nurse, you can do this with a two-year degree. Um, and you can uh, be working while you're getting your bachelor's degree. That's what a lot of folks are doing. Southern Vermont College has identified that um, they want to become, uh, you know, they want all their nurses to become bachelor's degree, want all of their registered nurses to become DSNs, DSN bachelor, bachelor of Science in Nursing. Um, and they have agreed to pay for the folks who are RNs to get their BSN from Southern Vermont College online or in person, which is right there in their community. And in return, what they're asking people to do is to sign a commitment that they'll stay with the employer. This is the kind of model, that's an incentive that um, builds better communities. It's you know a, a model that we'd like to see replicated in other parts of the state. So that's just one example. I love, I love what they're doing in Southern Vermont. Other questions? Maureen? Um, yeah, I had a question actually on this chart. One of the things that surprised me was kind of the consistency of the replacement positions across, you know, those, the first, like the four largest there. And um, understanding 30% may go to retirement, you know, I wonder are some of them shifting between other hospitals or some of them, you know, um, just are totally shifting to a different profession. I mean, that just seemed really high, especially when you would go across and say some of the education requirements are more than others. So some of them, if they're entry level from a high school, you, you may see them shift to other positions. But if you've earned your RN, either with the bachelor's or the two-year degree, to actually have so much in replacement, it just seems like a big challenge. Well, and I, I heard a variety of different things from um, AHEC. Uh, so I'll just say Mary Bell Palumbo is um, a colleague that I rely on for every every move that I make because I am not an industry expert. So I go to Mary Bell and I say, why? Why do you think this? And she said things like, you know, when the economy is good, a lot of nurses don't want to work full time. And you know, when uh, spouses get laid off and jobs are uncertain, they want to go back. So there's a variety of reasons why that um, you know we can posture about. But I, I know that the turnover rate has uh, a lot of different economic influences, not just um, I'm not happy with my work environment. Um, sometimes it's you know I can work days and not nights, you know, or and those things are not really reflected in these numbers, but um, they are important. You know, when you consider work environment, the, the, the number one thing that we heard was that nurses are on the front line, and they're picking up the slack with, for all of the workforce shortage that's occurring at the hospital. You know, um, and it's because they're on the front line. There's nobody else to do it. So. They may be changing beds, they may be serving meals, they may be showering people, they may be doing things that all those other jobs um, typically would would do, but nobody's there to do it. So everybody short hand. Okay, thanks. Sure. Other questions? Yeah, I just have a quick question about, so this seems like a really helpful demand side analysis of what is the forecasted demand for nursing, and I'm wondering if, there's also been the supply side analysis looking at, for example, so you, there's 3,900 vacancies roughly that we can expect. How many nurses in all the various categories are currently in the pipeline that will be expected to graduate in two years? What is the potential for enticing um, former nurses who have you know, left the field to, to recertify and come back in? I mean, is there any supply side analysis of how what the gap is actually going to be in terms of the pipeline versus yeah, I, I actually, so when I sat down with Mary Val from AHEC, she said, we are, we have our finger on the pulse of the supply side. Um, we can tell you, here's how many people are in programs throughout the state. I don't have all that data, but we could put it together. Um, and I know there's someone here from AHEC, I'm just gonna ask. Um, do you have any of that anecdotally um, that you know of? I 
Yeah. I mean, that seems like really important, right? So if Absolutely. this is 3,900, yeah. is it 3,000 that we have in the pipeline? Is it 2,000, uh, you yeah. know, 1,500? So we have, we have yeah. five nursing programs in our yeah. state. Each one of them reported out at our summit, right? So um, the largest one was about 120. Yeah, so we're... So, um, and that's uh, in a year. And it, like the majority of them, I'm gonna say Norwich had like maybe 40. Yeah. Castleton had maybe 50. It's about, um, two yeah. years ago, it was about like 300 K out of Vermont schools. So right. Right. And and North North right. two years. So, so again, that includes those out of state students. Yeah, so most of these nursing positions are gonna to have to be drawn from either people in the state who may re-up, but largely it's gonna be out of state. Well, state remember, the, those are people who are going through the BSN program, right? Um, and some of them are going through the LPN if they're at Vermont Tech. These others, these can be developed in other places. Mm -hmm. I, I actually had this question. I'm like, so we have a, uh, we need some of these, right? Licensed practical nurses. Could this be developed at the tech center level? It's a one-year program. Um, they say no because you have to be 18 to do a clinical. So I'm like, is that a regulation we can change? Mm -hmm. You don't have to be 18 to do this. Why would you? I, I don't I, yeah. I, I, I just, you know, poking questions at some of the stuff that we have. What if you were able to do this in high school, and then you could do one year of Vermont Tech to get your registered nurse, and then your hospital would pay for you to get your BSN. That'd be good. Um, so there's a lot of different ways these things could happen that you could make, um, you know, get more people through the pipeline, mm -hmm. but um, we really have to come together on it and make decisions that are, that lift all votes, you know? so. Well, when we talk about this, we talk about you know the the um, employer getting something out of it, and they're going to have to give something too, and the educator who are getting something out of it because they're able to put you know more nurses through their program and have better outcomes for their students, but really the the labor market is the one who gets the most out of it because there's such a need out there, and they are good jobs, but. So in many cases, it looks like we have to reevaluate how we value them. So I'm going to say, in particular, these two roles need employer observation on how to do this better. If we spent, if we talked to them about nothing else, those two things would be a huge opening of a bottleneck. So, yeah. Other yeah, questions? I guess we'll open it up to the audience. Jill. Hi, uh, I'm Jill Olson of the Executive Director of Phoenix in Vermont. Hi, Hi. I'm Ed Patterson. And I really appreciated your presentation and the, just the structure that you're sort of putting around this, this issue. My question that I was reflecting on after I left Castleton was whether you're only focusing on nursing or if you're focusing on healthcare workforce in general. It looks like you have PCAs on your list who are not not really, it's not a, really a nursing position, but it's certainly one that's really important in uh, long-term care in particular, and then also PT, OT, and some of those other disciplines. Okay. So um, when we did our, our first, what one of the most critical jobs, you can see here we have eight, right? Yeah. Um, we, we took the top 10. I see, okay. Um, and so physicians were in that. And then we had another grouping that we called rehab services, which were occupational speech and physical therapists. Yes. Um, I let them do all of the sorting. So here's where we see these. So in order to be effective in, um, say, a career pathway, the decision was made that we're going to focus on nursing. And we called these jobs. You're calling CH nurses, though. Yeah, I know. We, okay. called, no, that's okay. we just... called these jobs healthcare assistants. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But they're on your list, that's why they're on that term. Exactly, okay. yeah. So um, it was really hard to eliminate because there were so many important ones and so much, um, so, so many of them uh, repeated over and over, like duplications of them 
that we were like, okay, who, who can we cut out? So we, call it, we created four categories of nursing. Um, and we said uh, nurse practitioner and advanced practice mental health nurse were going in one category because the training was relatively similar. Um, nurse educator and clinical nurse manager was in a category called nurse manager. And then skilled nurse included registered nurse and LPN, even though we know the training is not the same. Um, they're still administering medicines and doing a lot of yeah, similar type of work. And then we said LNAs and personal care was like mo more like a healthcare assistant. So when people answered it, they answered it by job category. But when we look to like training <coughs> providers, we are sort of thinking, okay, you might have a um, similar level of education for these folks. There might be some different um, types of classes that you would create to make them good at what they do, you know, if you're upskilling existing nurses. So. Well, that's well, I just think the approach to PCAs in particular is very different. It's not really a nursing educator topic. So it's I, going to be a different approach. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. So I'll just say um, I'm speaking on behalf of not myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On a, a group of other people. Yeah. So that's that's the decision that they made. Yeah. So every time we get them together, we involve them in some sort of a workshop where we're developing consensus and we're um, generating ideas and things like that. There's nobody standing up here like I am right now. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, we're, they're active members and that's why they're engaged. So like when we do a survey, um, we typically get 100% engagement in a survey because they're they're all there because they need to be there because they need they need workers so if, if they've chosen to become part of the employer collaborative they're there because they chose to be there we're not dragging anybody along so uh, thank you right here yes thank you yeah, Jessica Barnard with the Vermont Medical Society and I have a somewhat related question to Jill's I think uh, but even stepping back a little further about how you define the healthcare industry or the employers you invited to participate it sounds like it was largely sort of hospitals and the continuation and sort of post hospital care I'm wondering if you also included say um, the designated agencies or physician practices or more what I see as ambulatory outpatient employers no. well we could um, you know, so these are just numbers that are representative of a subset of the workforce. So we could include anybody at any point. You know, the idea behind this is we're building something that benefits the entire industry. So, you know, I'm only a staff of one, so I, I'm just going to say. Yeah. Curious when you say healthcare industry, obviously that reflects who part of that conversation. That's right. But the numbers might look That's right. depending which subset of that sector you yeah. are asking. For. So we went to our regional partners and said, invite all the healthcare em employers in your region. And that's who came, you know? So uh, I didn't create the list either. I just sent the invitation from John Barmstead to say, um, you know, we're having this problem and we're, we'd like to get together and share this collective impact model with you. And then people said, that's our problem too. Yes, I would like to do that. Um, so in, at any point, we welcome, like I just added someone from um, uh, BNA in Central Vermont. Yeah, so um, because they asked, can, can I be part of this? And I said, yeah, sure, of course. Um, let me share some of this with you. And so we went through the model and and what the employers had, you know, already come up with. And I said, do, do you think this is suitable for you? How does this work with your business? Do you, you know, and I asked her a lot of questions and so now they're part of it too. So honestly, um, the, being being a member of the collaborative is just not a high bar. It's like, you, you, know, <laughs> you, you, have to, you know, you have to say that you, you want to, you know, support it. And it, the contribution that you make is you will respond to any kind of survey that we put out and develop it in order to respond to it. So, um, you know, it's it, we try to be as organic as possible 
but also inclusive of anybody who who feels like this is part of their mission too. Right here. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation, Marianne. I'm Jeff Tiemann with the Hospital Association. Um, I'm just curious, um, both demand and supply can be affected by factors within Vermont and factors outside of Vermont. So the example I'm thinking of right now is the proposed mandatory nurse staffing ratios in Massachusetts, which would create a huge demand for new nurses in that state and then would have you know, an impact on our both supply and demand side of the equation. So I'm just curious how, and I know this is a piece of it, but um, how your sort of assessment and analysis would, would factor in those kind of um, developments. That's interesting. Um, so I hadn't heard that before, but like, remember we're developing a list of like amendments that need to be reviewed. And potentially that's a regulation thing that we want them to know about and also to be able to respond to in a way that, you know, is appropriate. I, I don't I don't have the answer to that one and I had never heard that before. But now I feel like I have to write that down. <laughs> so that's important. Yeah. Good question though. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Ken Libertong and uh, I've been a mental health advocate uh, for many years. And I I, I I couldn't help but I think when I uh, looked at some of the projections on nursing that it's a very optimistic portrayal of the future if you compare it to what the mental health field and the substance abuse field might look like if you did the same study. Uh, I, think, I think conditions would be much less rosy uh, mm -hmm. than what you're projecting here. One of the things that I react to though is the fact that um, I think it's important to, to begin to lay out this information, but it, I'm always um, troubled by the fact that when employers and round, t round table type people get together, um, they're, they, they are the world of the experts. Um, I think that you could really have a more full understanding if, for example, uh, you would sit down, in this case, with groups of nurses. And they could tell you, I think, pretty succinctly why we're looking at a, a very concerning future in this part of the healthcare field. Again, I think this is a much more optimistic. So, you know, I, I have to say that in my experience, there are probably three or four things that, you know, you would hear. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I don't, I don't, you know, don't disagree I, with that at all. And you know, I hope, I hope, you know, it's, it's not the only the employer. The reason that you know I think that we have a pending crisis is one we don't have necessarily uh, adequate payment for salaries for work done in Vermont. Yeah. Now it's you know there are big differences. Uh, UVM Medical is in a separate category compared to. The, the nursing home in your area. Yes. I mean, totally different reality. But uh, one of the reasons there's such enormous turnover, particularly in the nursing home and auxiliary kind of thing, is the <coughs> pavement and the lack of real regulation, even though the regulation is not Value. useful. Yeah. Anyway, that's one. The other right. is that uh, in many of these fields, uh, it's really not very uh, wise to go into them because the cost of an education is so great that and you look at your potential you know wages uh, you're not so so you know second part of this is I think you know somebody should look at the question is there a way of modeling with some of these business <laughs> leaders in the round table to say we if we have parts of our healthcare system that need help there should be help to reduce or pay back um, educational expenses, and you know, and then the third is sort of the problem of I, I, if you hear from people working in the field, there's certainly some tendency to be overworked and underpaid. And the overworked part is something that you could hear more about if you went into, you know, if you heard from people who were there right and now doing the work. Nursing education will tell you that very thing definitely. Well, so I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Do you have more? <laughs> I'm like, I wanted, I wanted to just say the people who were, were responding to the survey were not the CEOs and presidents. They were the chief nursing officers, 
and uh, folks in HR. So we get sponsorship from the top level when we begin. <coughs> yes, our organization commits to this. And then there's a handoff. So our first demand planning session, we ask for the hiring managers. So the people who are responsible, who really know what the needs of the industry are. So I think we have um, the correct people answering the questions on the survey, but I'll just say, um, and developing the survey. But uh, I, I have to agree with you on the, um, the cost of education and the salaries. What, what I hope to see come out of this is what we're seeing in the other industries, which is a low barrier entry point that once you're hired by the employer, there's some kind of payment that um, is associated with upscaling to the next level. So there are career pathways that are developed by employers that they'll stand behind, like the one at Southern Vermont College. So, like, if, like, and this is just in my, you know, pipe dream here, if you were able to graduate from high school or a technical center with um, the uh, licensed practical nurse, if, if that were the case, or say you were, um, that's a post high school program, a one year thing that's no cost to a student, then you would have the ability to start working and get your associate's degree while you're working. And the employer could pay for that. And then the employer will, you know, potentially uh, be able to help you get your DSN over a period of time. So those are retention strategies that would, I think, work well with them. But all these things have to come together, you know? So we don't have all that yet. But. Hi. Uh, so my name is Susan Lynn. I am the HR Director of Washington County Mental Health. And this all sounds great, but I want to piggyback on what Ken said. We don't have the money to pay for people to continue their education or to be competitive with the hospitals or to sit on some of these round tables. So it's, it's, it's a real challenge to hear about this. And I think this is a much rosier picture in the private sector and the healthcare and the hospitals than what we're seeing as designated agencies. So my question for the group is, is there funding available to help well, those employers? Are there grants? Are there, we are are there programs and I mean, internships? And, and I think can we sit on these councils and, and get some, some traction? And, so the Department of Labor, like I said, those WIO funds at the beginning, those are um, Workforce Investment Opportunity Acts. So the way that that funding works is you have to show that there's a demand because employers say that they need it. And if you do that, there can be a funding stream for training that goes along with that from the Department of Labor. So we work really closely with labor to make sure that these things are laid out properly. Um, it, in the past, the Department of Labor has distributed VOA funds in a different way. They actually asked um, people who were doing training to uh, get themselves on this list of approved tra training providers. And if you were on that list and someone came and said, I'm eligible for VOA funds, oh, let's see. Good. We'll give you some money. That's how they did it in the Department of Labor. Well, I think if you're getting much more knowledgeable about, okay, we have data that supports this, we can put on an entire program that lasts a year. We can do an apprenticeship program. We could do, you know, there are lots of different ways that they can do it. And apprenticeships are one of the things that are coming up um, from the TV show, The Apprentice. <laughs> um, apprenticeships actually are, are receiving a lot of federal funds. Um, so I think that that's going to be um, one possible route. You know, I, I haven't put all these pieces together totally, but you can see that there are connections. Um, and it's a matter of us uh, having some real down-home communication between all the, all the parties to make it work. And that's how collective impact will benefit, you know, this entire industry. You know, we can't have um, folks over here doing one thing and over here saying another without, you know, actually having a dialogue. But I, I actually thought that meeting at Castleton was really helpful because you got to hear a variety of different viewpoints 
And it was really just a dialogue. It was like a starting point for um, all these folks who are, you know, from different uh, parts of that sector. You know, where the educators, where the employers, where the um, where the stakeholders, where the board members from Green Mountain Care were, you know, and and it was a really good dialogue to continue that happening. You know, the the point of having meetings, in my opinion, is not to hear someone share their stuff. It's more of a, um, let's hear from you. And so that's why, like, I really, I find that this dialogue that I'm having with you guys is of tremendous value to me. So, Deb. Yeah, I just wanted to comment. So, like, part of the reason we got that group together, too, was to just be creative, think outside the box about how do we attract nurses to this state. I mean, salary is an issue. We are ranked 47th um, for nursing pay adjusted for cost of living. Um, obviously, we're not going to make great strides in that in the next two years. So what else can we be doing? And I, I heard him mention like the Massachusetts initiative. I'm not 100% sure I agree with everything in their initiative, but stuff like safe staffing ratios, stuff like no lifting policies, that attracts people because they know they're going to be safe in their assignment and they're not going to break their backs or their next lifting patients. So there's other things that can be done to make this an attractive state for nurses to come to. Mm -hmm. well, we, we even heard things like you know, shift um, changes that would uh, attract people who are studying while they're, um, while they're working. And then also shift opportunities for people who are in their senior years. Because a lot of those folks feel that they can't do a 12-hour shift anymore. But does that mean that they can't work in nursing? No. Um, so there's a lot of more creative um, and innovative ideas that are coming from these folks. Um, and I think that, you know, conversations like this, you know, instead of complaining about them, we need to put them out there and say, here's, here's the way we could improve. How can you help us? We need these things, you know? And I think that it will, I can't say it's all going to work out, but, I, you know, I think it's going to uh, improve. I mean, that's, that's a positive. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 aye.